This was a much more self-conscious and deliberate business than Watership Down, which was very largely spontaneous. I've got strong views about um, using animals, uh, as you probably know. Um, and I decided to write a book that would do three things, actually, and this was quite deliberate. It would show the horrors of animal experimentation, and it would make fun of newspaper reporters, <laughs> whom I had come to dislike by that time, and it would be based, as Watership Down was based on this country round here, uh -huh. so uh, my book would be based on the only other landscape that I knew like the back of my hand, and that's the Lake District. Mm -hmm. As Bakhtin Volosinov first laid out, and Julia Kristeva later expounded, literature exists in a continual dialogue with past works and past authors. For example, when we read James Joyce's Ulysses, we decode it as a modernist literary experiment, or as a response to the epic tradition, or as part of some other conversation, or as part of all of these conversations at once. This isn't limited to postmodernism, as even the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Within the realm of xenofiction, certainly no one could dispute that Richard Bach's Jonathan Livingston Seagull attempts to be an animal New Testament with its many quotations from the Bible, and it couldn't have happened without Watership Down giving new life to the concept of talking animals as acceptable subjects of serious literature. Amusingly, does this position Watership Down as a sort of animal Old Testament? If that's the case, then Adam's later novel, The Plague Dogs, can have no other parallel in the Western canon than Shakespeare. At first glance, this seems preposterous. The novel lays out a simple adventure about two dogs, the terrier Snitter and the black mongrel Ralph, who escape an animal research lab and aimlessly wander the inhospitable wilderness of the English Lake District National Park. A media hype blossoms around a newspaper's fabricated allegation that they're infected with bubonic plague. This triggers a snowball effect of scientists fighting to shift the blame, politicians struggling to keep face, and newspapers trying to raise circulation by further blowing up the story, which finally ends in a witch hunt for the innocent dogs. This brief summary should remind you of an earlier animal novel, although a very different one, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim which came out six years earlier. Both are about animals escaping from scientific experiments. Both share an ambiguous open ending. In Nim, Justin the Rat, the main hero, ends up missing and the author died before she could write a sequel and confirm if he was still alive. The Plague Dog has a similarly controversial ending, one filled with myths and misconceptions, which I'll soon clear up. Moreover, the Plague Dogs also aims to teach the reader something, and I don't just mean it hopes to spread awareness of animal cruelty. I speak of a message that was obscured through the years by a well-intentioned movie adaptation that strayed away from the original work. Watchers of Nim's more popular film will remember the story's themes being about prevailing through bravery and how motherhood can surpass any obstacle, but that was actually pretty much absent in the book. In the book, Mrs. Frisbee is saved by Justin in most instances, and she's not even involved with the story's resolution. The book is more concerned with showing the rats of Nim as a classic group of vulnerable underdogs who become strong and outwit their oppressors, not through the acquisition of fantasy superpowers, but by the simpler yet equally effective power of learning to read. It was a message with strong resonance for all the readers who were themselves, in a way, also growing more powerful because of what they were learning even as they read the story. However, that's a message which couldn't be replicated through animation, unless it was a mute film which forced the kids to read text on screen. A similar thing happened with Plague Dogs, as I'll soon explain. Very few have analysed Plague Dogs critically, 
I'm going to mention the ideas proposed by Anja Hoing, Germany, and David Collado Rodriguez, Spain in great measure. Haddis Marcus's smart essay, An Eco-Critical Approach to Cruelty in the Laboratory, was already covered in length by fellow YouTuber Cardinal West in a video you should very much check out. However, both West's video and Marcus's essay are dangerously attached to, and seem to prefer, the animated adaptation of Adams's novel. And I believe that's not just due to subjective taste, but is a result of missing the hidden themes in the novel which preclude any validity from its adaptation. Let's start at the beginning. Adams opens The Plague Dogs with a rather cryptic quote in Greek that he chose not to translate. At first glance, it looks like a pretentious epigraph, which is what some contemporary reviewers called it. However, it's not an epigraph at all, but the second half of Adams's dedication to his wife, as it's a passage that relates to femininity. It gets clearer when you translate it. The passage comes from the history of the Peloponnesian War and reads, If I must allude to the virtue of those wives who will now be in widowhood, I will make everything clear in a brief piece of advice. There will be great honour for you if you live up to the standards of your true nature, and for her who is least mentioned among males, whether for praise or for blame. Adams might have chosen this passage ironically, as it seems rather repressive of women, or not, but regardless, it was not coincidental, as it's the last scene before a large plague breaks out in Thucydides' writing. And it doesn't end there. I believe the passage Adams chose relates to the plague dogs in three ways. Firstly, we must establish the context of the passage is a dialogue by Pericles, the leading Athenian statesman of the time, who is giving a funeral oration to the Athenian population, partly to justify causing so many deaths in the Peloponnesian War, because he keeps advising his people to hold back and not battle in the open. Thucydides, the writer, praised Pericles constantly throughout this and previous chapters, but after the passage, a plague suddenly takes over Athens. It's very painful, kills a lot of people, and increases lawlessness, as people felt they had nothing to fear anymore. Amidst this chaos, Pericles tries to preach to his people in one last feeble attempt to regain authority, but now even Thucydides turns against him in his narration, calling Pericles a tyrant. In the end, Pericles is taken by the plague too. Of course, choosing the passage which acts as prelude to a plague is not coincidental. During the description of the event of the plague, dogs get a special mention. Quote, the birds and animals which feed on human flesh, although so many bodies were lying unburied, either never came near them or died if they touched them. This was proved by a remarkable disappearance of the birds of prey, which were not to be seen either about the bodies or anywhere else, while in the case of the dogs the result was even more obvious because they live with man. End quote. Adams might have wanted to link his dogs of the plague with the earliest recorded in classical literature. The passage might also establish the novel's themes of the manipulative nature of media and politics, which Adams goes on to satirise. The third subject tackled by the dedication, which I would be remiss to ignore, is that of feminism. Adams doesn't pick the passage about the dogs, but one five chapters earlier about women. Different scholars have interpreted this passage in different ways. E.C. Marchant, for example, asserts that Pericles' advice that women should live up to the standards of their true nature, by no means attributed weakness, but referred to the restraints and household duties which nature imposed on women. Pericles referred to the Spartan women, who, according to Aristotle, lived a very different life from the stern asceticism of the Spartan men. Moreover, it's hard to assert the extent of Thucydides' approval of Pericles' words, since he praises the statesman in one moment and attacks him the next. However, there's the uncomfortable fact that taking Thucydides' work as a whole, he never uses any opportunity to name women, and even dogs get a moment during his description of the plague when women don't. A female scholar, Kelly E. Shannon Henderson, opines that Thucydides' work suggests he believes that women have almost no place in a political military history at all, and probably should have no place there. Women have a detrimental effect on events in which they participate and are associated with treachery and murder. 
their prominence undermines the stability of the Greek world as a whole. Scholar David Harvey takes more of a middle ground, conceding women are indeed ignored by Thucydides, but advising we shouldn't draw moral conclusions from this, as it might have been a consequence of his decision to concentrate on contemporary political and military Greek history, and not the areas where women came to the fore. Any kind of psychological analysis beyond this is uncalled for. So how does Adams come into this? What position does he take? By opening his book by mentioning the women right before the scene where dogs take more prominence than their entire gender, is he drawing attention to that erasure? When BBC announced they would make a new adaptation of Adam's Watership Down, executive producer Rory Aitken publicly stated that the team felt it would be beneficial to have a greater balance of male and female characters. In response, Adams's daughter Juliet said it was her understanding that female rabbits were given a feminist makeover at the BBC's insistence and said, quote, If you're going to start social engineering like that, make sure your own house is in order, don't you think? End quote. We shouldn't take these words as anti-feminist right off the bat. As the Global Policy Journal pointed out, that the complex world of rabbit politics also features an exclusion of women from decision-making and some degree of misogyny should be marked as a win for realism, not given demerits. And even that is contested, with some believing Adams's treatment of women shines on characters like Heisenthle, Thethuthinang, and the does that agree to come to Watership Down because they would have more say in their lives and could choose their mates freely. Of course, all of this preamble skips over the fact that there's not much of a female presence in Adam's book, which is rather interesting, isn't it? Oh, and they made the reporter a, a woman for some reason. They said there weren't enough females in the story. <laughs> Digby Driver became a rather improbable female. The book proceeds to employ a true first epigraph, a quote from poet Samuel Johnson's annotated Shakespeare. Specifically, Adams picks the moment Johnson suddenly breaks off from making learned notes in order to voice his disgust at vivisection. He has reached Act 1, Scene 5, Line 23 of Cymbeline. The Queen has commissioned a selection of most poisonous compounds from the physician Cornelius. He somewhat diffidently asks her what she wants them for. Basic research is her reply, to see what happens using cats and dogs for the purpose. In this, the Queen speaks for a long line of future scientists. Cornelius replies that, quote, the only certain result of your studies will be to diminish your humanity, end quote. And although such a research project would be characteristic of her, she's of the wicked stepmother class, the Queen is not really engaged in it at all. Rather than knowledge, her mind is on her career, or her son's career. Her intention is to clear his path to the throne with poison. Samuel Johnson's notes to Shakespeare are in general aimed at clarifying obscurities in the text or suggesting emendations, but what Cornelius says moves him so much that he puts aside the textual critic and speaks as a moralist or simply as a man, and this is what Adams quotes devoid of context. There is in this passage nothing that much requires a note, yet I cannot forbear to push it forward into observation. The thought would probably have been more amplified had our author lived to be shocked with such experiments as have been published in later times by a race of men that have practiced tortures without pity and related them without shame and are yet suffered to erect their heads among human beings. Dr. Johnson With all the themes properly established, we can now begin looking at the novel itself. As one begins to read, it quickly becomes clear Adams isn't limiting his Shakespeare to an opening quote as he proceeds to reference King Lear, Hamlet and Winter's Tale. Slitter's balmy language, which is based on the fool in King Lear, uh -huh. that he, he talks what appears to be nonsense, which often actually contains the truth. Um, this is very hard to do. Throughout the novel, the narrator champions the voice of literature over the voice of science. We get to know him as a highly educated, at times even lyrical, storyteller who is able to draw inspiration from virtually the entirety of the Western canon. He references Freud, the muse Urania, Joyce, Blake, Milton, Cervantes, Golding, the Bible, T.S. Eliot, Orwell, Bronte, Euripides, Plato, Marlowe, Bunyan, and Dr. Doolittle to boot. 
Adams uses previous works to show up the shortcomings of the discourse of literature in a similar way to his polemic dismantling of the discourse of science. In the first scene of the story, for example, the narrator describes a tank fouled with urine and saliva while Ralph is fighting for his life. The surface is a watery harlequin's coat of tilting planes and lozenges in movement. The streaks of urine are gilded, and bubbles of saliva are rocking turgidly. In this description, we realise a gap between the narrator himself, a gap between the tenor and the vehicles of metaphors. The narrator's language is the language of literature, but just like the empty discourse of science, the high register and metaphorical complexity of literature doesn't unveil reality. Instead, it glosses over the sufferings of Ralph, who pointedly in this scene is refused both agency and a voice. In presenting as an epitome of beauty what is in fact a hideous reality, the narrator is literally reliable, but metaphorically unreliable. Convention has taught us to consider the metaphorical level the apex of literary language and to trust it above all others, so this creates a substantial gap between narrator and reader. Although very complex, the novel's intertextuality was first noticed in a 1978 review by John Leonard, who was so proud of himself that he sold his review condemning this showing off to a plethora of newspapers. Another contemporary negative review accused Adams of ripping off Wordsworth, choosing when to anthropomorphize arbitrarily and lacking subtlety in his soapbox. Adams was sure to put people off with his strong opening. The Shakespeare quotation not only sets high goals, but establishes the novel as postmodern in a way that goes beyond the bard. And what does the author say of all these hidden layers? Quote, I've never pretended to be grinding some great axe. I'm an entertainer, and that's what I try to be as an entertainer, a storyteller. The stories are different, and I'm not trying to grind any particular axe. It's just for amusement, really. End quote. When Hazel Owen interviewed Adams in 1995 as part of a doctoral research project, Adams conceded there could be depths he himself is unaware of. Uh, you mean it's a moral book? It does you good morally? Yes, I think so. Well, perhaps there are things in the book that I haven't perceived myself. In an interview leading up to the release of The Plague Dogs, Adams did admit that, quote, the comparison between the dog's relationship to man and man's relationship with God is inescapable. It's an ironical point. The dogs have a yearning to love men and to serve men, but the men have let them down. They've burned and drowned them and let them suffer for no reason. God's a bit like that too sometimes, isn't he? End quote. He quickly clarified, though, that he was no political reformer, just a novelist. When asked about his decision to use anthropomorphic animals, Adams explained, quote, This is a very, very old form of storytelling, one which is absolutely basic to the whole history of humanity. Anthropomorphic fantasy is a safe form of social satire in all societies, particularly repressive societies. If you lived in a certain tribe, for example, and you wanted to criticize the chief without getting your head cut off, you could tell a funny story about it using animals instead of people and make your point without endangering yourself. You'd expect in a technological society that this sort of thing would drop out, but not a bit of it. It's still here as a potent force, a force I'm determined to exploit. End quote. Animals in, in stories, of course, as you know, uh, well, the oldest stories in the world are about animals, the oldest folk tales that we have. Uh, they weren't children's stories. Uh, they were stories to which everybody listened. The novel's subjectivity also functions to show the double character of the dog's quest, which is real and metaphysical. Adams is deeply influenced by Carl Jung, and in the novel the reasons which force the reader to identify with the dogs are more complex than they may seem. Snitter often thinks of his old master, who he thinks he killed by driving him into a car, but he's constantly torn, wondering that he might still be alive. Snitter starts to unconsciously reflect on his hallucinations in an encounter with a mysterious ghost dog in the book's most critical scene, a scene missing from the film. Snitter, one of the two main dogs, suffered a brain surgery intended to make him confuse the objective with the subjective. Interpret that as you may, although Adams claims all of the experiments portrayed happened in real life, 
but the effect in the novel is that his dreams and reality are often blurred. Awakened by a dog's bark, Snitter finds a terrier bitch whose appearance recalled others from the days of his old life with his master. She turns out to be watching over the long-decayed corpse of her master, oblivious of his death. Even though he's sure that she's another individual, he also immediately grasps her metaphorical meaning. In a Snitter-typical fit of madness, he imagines a conversation with Rolf. Hello, Snitter. Are you all right? Oh yes, only there's two of me now. I split my head in two and made another dog. Here she is. Woof, woof, ho, ho. For Snitter, there is no contradiction in the ghost terrier being both a different individual and a part of himself. And metaphorically, there isn't. Jung's theory makes its strongest appearance in Snitter's encounter with the ghost bitch. The female terrier is, in fact, his anima. She is an archetypal force, a reflection of his soul, both frightening and attracting him, part demonic and, crucially, of the opposite gender. Jung describes the anima as both magical and dangerous, concerned with the taboos the consciousness tries to avoid dealing with. On his nightly excursion, Snitter confronts his own unconscious, a loyal dog stubbornly guarding a human corpse, incapable of letting go of the illusion that her master will return. Snitter sees her predicament, deeply pities her, and finally even calls in her face, Your master, your master is dead. He's dead. But the moment he starts to glimpse the truth, that it's his master he's talking about, Snitter panics. He draws back, suddenly seeing the ghost bitch as a phantom, a nothing, a dried, empty husk of old grief suffered long ago. When seconds later, an apparition of his master appears, Snitter, none the wiser from his encounter with his anima, still denying reality, runs after him. The first supernatural element in the book came into play right after the dogs escaped. Snitter summons an inner force, an ancestral power, which would help the dogs to become wild animals. From this instinctual phenomenon, Snitter and Ralph will end up virtually as one single being, the brains of the little terrier combine with the strength of the large mongrel in their quest for survival. Soon after that, a messenger from this ancestral force appears in the figure of the Todd. There again, you see, you've got this concept of the helper. The, the, um, the, do the dogs have escaped from the uh, laboratory, and nothing can ever be the same again. They can't go back. Yes. Uh, they're at a loss. And uh, then there comes to them this strange, weird character, uh, just like the helper in the fairy stories, mm -hmm. who offers to uh, sell them his brains in return for Ralph's strength. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where that idea really came from. The Todd, a genderless fox, reveals the connections with Shakespeare don't end with the epigraph. The novel is set in Lake District, Britain, where people speak Georgie English, which, as the author explains in a preface, still uses the Elizabethan genitive with words such as thy and thee. As the Todd speaks Georgie, understanding it can be quite a challenge. Something not many know is Adams himself didn't know Geordie, and he hired a specialist to translate it for him. Well, one thing I wanted right from the outset about the Todd, that he was going to talk Geordie. Mm -hmm. And I got made friends with a an expert he's dead now his name is scott dobson uh -huh. scott dobson made his living actually by exploiting geordie he published a geordie dictionary and he published a wonderful book called larnia sell geordie um <laughs> which should be read by everybody <laughs> and he used to give geordie concerts oh, and he's a, he was a most amusing character the poor chap he died heart attack um I used him. In, in fact, he wrote the Todd speeches, actually. We sat down together. He said, now, look, don't try and do it yourself. Uh, just tell me in English what you want the Todd to say. Yeah. And I'll, I'll do the Geordie. Mm -hmm. And he did. He did it wonderfully, I think. The, the, the Todd's last speech before he's killed by the hounds, I, I always find profoundly moving. Scott Dobson made a, a very good job mm -hmm. of that. Geordie, so beautiful when read aloud, was sadly watered down in the adaptation for the sake of clarity, as the director admitted in interviews. The Todd's character seems reminiscent of the mythical Reynard archetype, 
a devious, insinuating creature whose every word and movement seemed part of the spinning of some invisible net of stratagem. However, the romanticism of this character is deconstructed, its tragedy exposed. Quote, Suddenly a great flame of abandonment crackled up in the thorny tangle of Snitter's mind. He could be done with care. He too could become burdened with no name, no past, no future, with no regret, no memory, no loss, no fear but caution, no longing but appetite, no misery but bodily pain. No part of his self need be exposed except his awareness of the present, and that gone in an instant, like a fly snapped at and missed on a summer afternoon. He saw himself bold and wary, floating on life, needing nothing, obedient only to cunning and instinct, creeping through the bracken upon the quarry, vanishing from pursuers like a shadow, sleeping secure in hiding, gambling again and again, until at last he lost, and then departing with a shrug and a grin to make way for some other trickster nameless as himself. End quote. The Todd is haunted by the idea of the dark, feeling he's bound to return to it. It anticipates the end of the dog's adventure. At the same time, the fox explains to Snitter that a dark blue they perceive one day in the distance is the sea. From this moment on, the sea keeps appearing. Adams was aware the Geordie dialect was difficult, but he used the similarities with Elizabethan English to ease the way to an almost absolute obfuscation as a motif for the entire novel. Snitter's thoughts can cause the narration to become so unreliable, we're in the dark just as much as the dogs. We're in the dark linguistically, as the Todd's speech confuses us, physically, as the characters traverse mist, and as their hunger gets worse, they, and I quote, lie tense in a directionless, scentless obscurity where there is neither up nor down, end quote. We're in the dark geographically, as the scarce illustrations in the novel show only repetitive mountains that blend together, plus some maps which only make things worse, as they show the path the characters take, but often appear before that path has been taken, and the only markers are the names of mountains and countryside spots, which all sound the same. Although the movie removed some intentional confusion by simplifying the Todd's speech, I have to give it credit for nailing that feeling in the sound department. In a featurette included in the DVD extras, film director, writer and producer Martin Rosen said, I mean, At one point when the dogs are running out to sea, there's a Polish composer called Rudosowski who creates um, uh, uh, strange sounds by having everyone wear earphones, not of what everyone's playing, but just of what they're playing so they can't hear other people. So everything is a little off kilter and a little kind of scratchy like. And I wanted that abrasive sense going as they're running out toward the sea. There they are. Let me rest a while. Wake me when the dog comes back. This effect contrasts the dog's adventure to the world of the humans, the real versus the platonic ideal. As the novel explains, quote, a tiger presumably ought to have a reasonable chance of being able to approximate to an ideal of tiger and a sparrow to an ideal of sparrow. Surely our part in that lot is to do what we can to see that animals live in a world where they can fulfill their various functions, insofar as that's consistent with our own reasonable survival and happiness. End quote. The novel chooses the dog's viewpoint to force the reader to come closer to the fantasy world of the oppressed talking animals. The humans, meanwhile, keep being satirized, making the animals look as the most humane characters, while newspapermen, politicians and scientists appear as ludicrous and evil, with names like Animosity or Dr. Boycott. When in the ending the dogs are pursued by soldiers, Snitter and Rolf think that the sea is their only way to escape. According to Jung's theories, the sea is a universal symbol for the unconscious, that is to say, for life beyond conscience. And through Snitter's mind, we start to guess the connections this concept has with death. Quote, There's a flood of sleep coming to cover the houses, you know, blue and deep, a deep sleep, I'm calling it actually. End quote. Snitter perceives the coming of that symbolic deep blue sleep, and in effect, after being surrounded by the soldiers, the two dogs have no choice but to rush into the sea, and the reader comes to the logical end of the novel. Quote, cold, sinking, bitter, choking dark. 
End quote. They have come back to the sea, to the place from which they and all existing creatures were created, and the psychic Jungian adventure of Snitter and Ralph finishes here, in the return to the unconscious, to the source of life. But it's not all grim. Adams also wanted to add a metafictional element in his novel, and he offered a second happy ending for the dog's adventure. The animals are rescued from the sea by two naturalists who happen to be sailing at that moment. Nevertheless, the narrator, quoting a phrase from The Pilgrim's Progress, suggests that the whole thing may be nothing but a dream, and this possibility arises again on the book's last page. Men and dogs go away and, quote, the incoming tide flows up the beach and back, smoothing and at length obliterating the prints of Snitter and Rolf. Beyond, the lake glimmers, a mere streak of grey between invisible shores. End quote. The waters sweep away the last remains of the story. The mythical shores also disappear when night, the dark, comes. The Jungian novelist makes his dogs undergo a process of return to the other world, symbolised by the sea. The dog's adventure is an adaptation of the popular motif of the magic flight laid out by Joseph Campbell in his hero's journey. But these patterns reach their limits once the literary animal appears as animal. What happens to Joseph Campbell's hero if his final reward is denied to him because of his species? How does the Jungian unconscious function if there is no rationalistic Western human consciousness to balance the primitive instinctive nature of the unconscious but a canine one. The narrator doesn't seek to answer these questions, but he pushes them until they become deeply disconcerting for the implied reader, only to abruptly revert to an easier mode of storytelling at the very moment the reader might be seriously considering the dimensions of the answers. The movie tapped into these Jungian motifs to a degree, as the director mentions in interviews leading up to the movie that he wanted to focus on the dog's pursuit to recreate Jung's dream hallway, the feeling of running without knowing why we're being pursued. Mr. Rosen might not have been the right fit for the job, as he knew nil about animation before tackling Watership Down, and he insists on interviews on referring to the characters as actors and tackling the challenge as a live-action director. To him, quote, Whenever you see a human in a cartoon, unless it's done exquisitely well, it negates all the emotional content the filmmaker achieved up to that point. One is trying to get the audience to believe they're in a different kind of a world, but the minute they see a person they think, wait a minute, humans aren't painted that way, they don't move like that. And to me, a rotoscoped format only exacerbates the problem." End quote. Rosen originally turned down the chance to film the book. He said, quote, I read the book before it was published. I thought it was a compelling story, but told in a very complex way. I thought Adams's writing about humans wasn't up to the standard of his fantasy writing. Then I had the notion to concentrate on the dogs and avoid the humans as much as possible, portraying them one-dimensionally when I had to put them on the screen. End quote. I think it was very loyal and very, uh, very tuned to what the book was. Uh, Richard Adams, who passed away just, just recently, as many authors feel, uh, the book is the book, and anything other than the book is almost not worthy of discussion. Uh, but I think he respected the book. I think he respected the work I was trying to do, and we maintained a, a cordial relationship during the shooting. Look, Ralph, look. Everything's so still in there. If I was in there, covered over, my head would be cool. Things would keep still. Actually, you know, you're interpreting what the original author says, and you think you know what he's saying, and you try very hard to show that on film. On the other hand, there's a lot of stuff in the book that you don't really agree with. A newspaper asked in 1980 whether Rosen was getting advice from Richard Adams on how to film his book. Rosen said he talked to Richard all the time, but there was nothing he needed to ask him about the plague dogs. If he had to ask him about the book, he shouldn't have bought it. And so production was underway. 
Perhaps to find an audience for it, the marketing for the movie overwhelmingly mentioned Disney to say how unlike Disney it was. Talking dogs in a serious picture. Um, people are not really used to, at, at that time, this was a long time ago, were not used to having uh, animated characters in uh, difficult situations. And because we're so tuned into having dogs as pets, we, it was hard to see them in a situation where they were, in effect, prisoners and being tested. And uh, I, I, that was the, one of the major challenges. It's got this green collar, Jack. Nothing on it but a number. Let's put it in the back of the car, like, and get it off. Bloody hell! Oh, I delivered this very difficult film uh, that was in opposition to everything we all our conceptions about dogs and animals, nice, and animation, always funny, always nice. I mean, never let it be said that I went the easy way. <laughs> uh, I was encouraged to, because of the lack of uh, distribution uh, success in the film, is to cut one particular, seg one particular segment out, which I thought was very important, where the dogs are being tracked by a hunter. And as, there, as he takes his shot, uh, he falls. And uh, you see the body at the bottom, and then you see these two starving dogs go toward the body, and you know they're going to eat it. And I felt that was important, but they just said, uh, we don't want pets to eat humans. And so I took it out, and I, I, I regret that. Um, but you have responsibility to your distributor. You, you want to let them get the bang for their buck as much as they can. But I think it did alter the perception of the film. What's that up ahead? By the face of Dow Crag. Can you get closer? This focus on brutalism and edge was not only the movie's downfall, but it was applied inconsistently by adding feel-good moments that weren't in the book, such as implying all of the experiments will come to light, removing the Holocaust references, and having the Todd be heroic in a ridiculous Hollywood moment. The thing that really stuck in my gun, it was that the, uh, the fox hunting episode has been removed entirely mm -hmm. from the film. Instead, the police employ a couple of bloodhounds right. to follow Snitter around. And then you get an action in the film which is entirely out of character. The Todd, of his own accord, um, tells the dogs to go that way, and he goes this way, mm -hmm. deliberately to draw the bloodhounds off the scent. Well, and he's killed. Well, of course, that would be quite unlike the Todd. He never did anything except for his own good. Yes. He was a wild yes. animal. The idea of an unselfish, altruistic action would be quite foreign to the Todd. I say it was the movie's downfall from an economic standpoint. Distributors backed away mere days after the film's release, forcing Rosen to travel the country showing the film by himself and making him decide not to direct any more animated films. On a more upbeat note, the movie did find success critically and in modern times it is considered an arthouse film. In fact, director Wes Anderson loves it. Because of this false commitment to realism, the most important change might have been omitting the ghost scene. This causes an entire reading of the work to be impossible if you only watch the movie. Of course, it would have been impossible anyway, unless they had come up with a way to adapt the mimicking of other authors' style through some visual representation. Voices in protest raise now. I can hear them. They did the best they could with the medium they had. To this I say, if you're going to produce a lesser work, who is twisting your arm and forcing you to do it? There's no need to look for a deeper reason here other than the capitalistic desire for money, and I see no need to defend that. Especially considering Rosen later claimed he still owned the rights to Watership Down to produce the BBC series, an illegal move which helped him enter contracts worth $500,000. This resulted in a lawsuit from Richard Adams's family, a lawsuit that Rosen lost and for which he was forced to pay $95,000.
Goldcrest Films, the film's investing company, went bankrupt three years after the movie's release. Jake Eberts, one of the founders of Goldcrest, speaks about the film in his book, My Indecision is Final, The Spectacular Rise and Fall of Goldcrest Films. Quote, Providing money for the plague dogs was my first disaster. It was made for all the wrong financial reasons. In my view, the project had a fatal flaw, that Martin Rosen chose to make a very somber, very downbeat film. What came across on the screen was a tragic and depressingly bleak story, whereas in the book it is uplifting. The dogs achieve heroic stature by escaping, meeting a fox, almost being captured and finally getting away. In the end, they were going to live. In the film, they clearly drowned. End quote. Fortunately for everyone involved, the movie did recoup its investment shortly after, although that didn't stop the financing company's bankruptcy. And uh, a lot of people have said, well, did they drown? Uh, it's, it's all a, a, a sweetener about being picked up by Ronald Lockley, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I always say, well, it's, it's just as you like. Mm -hmm. My editor at Penguin Books was convinced that the dogs drowned. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, as I say in the, um, oh, you won't have seen this, it's the American edition, you won't have seen the, the poem in which the, the reader protests to the, uh, to the author that the dogs mustn't drown. Mm -hmm. That only came in the American oh, edition. Yes. Yeah. I myself didn't want the dogs to drown. <laughs> <laughs> After all that, it would be, it'd be heartbreaking to have them drown. And then my friend Gerald Gray, he said, well, um, poor little chap, I'm a snitter. He couldn't have had much of a life after the operation he'd had. It would have been better to knock him on the head. But, um, oh, I, I like to think that Snitter got home mm -hmm. and had a happy life. It's a common myth that Adams was forced to add a happy ending to the book due to editorial pressure after the first edition came out. Certainly Adams's wasn't one to shy away from brutality, being raised around the shadow of a dead brother who made young Adam see his father weep openly in a doctor's family that didn't duck or dodge from distressing things and then joining the army. But Adams actually wanted the happier ending from the beginning. Adams. I wanted them to have a happy ending. It was under pressure from various fans and supporters that I decided in the end to have a happy ending and it struck me as a very nice idea to have them rescued by Sir Peter Scott. Interviewer. They made an animated film of the Plague Dogs as well as Watership Down. Adams. They did. Interviewer. And they kept the original ending for the film. Was that a decision on the part of the filmmakers, or did they make that as the book was released? Adams. It was entirely them and not me. I would have put in the happy ending. I don't know why they didn't. They never told me. I felt that the ending was too convenient. Uh, the, the dogs were rescued at the last minute and all that. I, I expect that would have been much more satisfying to an audience. I just felt just was, it just couldn't happen. These dogs were doomed from day one and the demise was the thing we're leading to and how that was realized was what I was really going after. Are you all right? I think, yes, I think so. <laughs> um, I believe that the, the book's been made into a film. It has indeed. And um, what do you think of the film? I it's a much better reason. film than the film of Watership Down. Much better film. But um, there are certain things wrong with the film. Mm. Uh, it's the only film, I think, that must have a sadder ending than the book from which it comes. Um, because in, in the film they do drown. Mm -hmm. Indeed, escaping reality might be the only coping mechanism for an animal narrator caught in the world of the plague dogs. Snitter does in his hallucinations. Rolf does in finally entering the magical world of Snitter's happy pet fairy tale when he believes himself in dog heaven. The narrator does too, if indeed he makes up a happy ending after the dogs drowned. Is the narrator a coward then? Yes, you might say. And here we suddenly find ourselves looking through the eyes of Snitter, facing his anima on the moors, shouting the truth into her face, and never realizing that it's his truth, not hers. The reader is finally left to make their own decision if they want to follow the narrator's solution of playing ostrich, or if they dare to read the animal protagonists as animals, 
and in doing so to face the insanity underlying Western culture's tradition of anthropocentrism and self-deception. As for the movie, the director summed up what he thinks the story is about by saying, I use the dog's experience as a metaphor for something that most people feel, that feeling of being innocent and pursued and found guilty, where the hallway grows longer and narrower. It's that dream we all have, where you think, what am I doing here? What have I done wrong? I was out to affect people, to touch them in some way. I think if the book has a fault, it's too beastly. Yes. A lot of people have said to me it's too beastly.